Access Site Complications 1 by Natalia Odonovich and Robert Adaran from the Yale School of Medicine. While it was previously not the case, today in the United States, the most common access site is becoming the radial artery, with almost 50% of all procedures being performed via this approach in 2019. This is closely followed by femoral artery access, which is still very prevalent in the United States, although it has lost its appeal and is very rarely performed outside the U.S., generally comprising less than 20% of access sites in most European and Asian countries. Other types of vascular access, such as brachial, subclavian, etc., are far less common and will not be discussed in this video. We will start by discussing some of the radial access complications, the most common being radial artery occlusion. Also, bleeding and hematoma or pseudoaneurysm are worth noting and being able to recognize and treat. Here we see a dramatic example of a hematoma in an elderly gentleman. The hematoma can be soft and easily spread across fascial planes, or it can be limited to a single fascial plane and in rare circumstances lead to a compartment syndrome and need for urgent surgery. We show here a rare complication of the radial access site, a radial pseudoaneurysm. Watch the video carefully. Note the relatively large pulsatile mass at the access site, the pseudoaneurysm. In this case, it had to be managed surgically, but at other times it will often thrombose spontaneously or with compression. Moving on to femoral access, the list is much longer and complications potentially more serious, ranging from benign and cosmetic-like ecchymosis or oozing to bleeding and vessel injury all the way to infection. This is an example of ecchymosis and groin hematoma complicating femoral access. In this slide, we see an example of a CT scan from a patient who underwent a procedure via left femoral artery access and who developed a massive retroperitoneal hemorrhage resulting in shock. This echogenic collection represents the retroperitoneal hematoma. Here we show the duplex ultrasound of a groin pseudoaneurysm that developed in an 86-year-old man who presented for coronary angiography, he was found to have left main disease and was given 10,000 units of heparin during the procedure for intravascular ultrasound. Despite a clean front wall femoral artery stick, angiography revealed that the access was low, a closure device was not used, and instead the sheath was sutured in place. It was retrieved around two hours later once the ACT was lower, but it was noted at the time that a large groin hematoma had developed despite manual pressure followed by a FEM stop applied. Ultimately, the patient had a residual pulsatile mass with brewy that on ultrasound was found to be a large groin pseudoaneurysm. You can see here that the aneurysm has a 1.8 centimeter neck and the patent part of the aneurysm is about two centimeters in size, but the actual aneurysm, including the thrombose part, is almost five centimeters in diameter. The patient underwent ultrasound-guided thrombin injection. On the left, you can see the access needle being placed into the pseudoaneurysm, and on the right-hand side, an angiogram of the pseudoaneurysm itself. 300 units of thrombin was injected into the pseudoaneurysm. The next day, the body of the pseudoaneurysm is thrombosed while the neck is still patent, but over time it too thrombosed. 
Here we see access complication in the form of vascular perforation in a 53-year-old woman with a BMI of 23 who presented with ACS. At the end of the case, upon taking the femoral angiogram, perforation of the inferior epigastric artery was noted with contrast extravasation into the peritoneum. In the DSA films on the right, we can clearly see the origin of the hemorrhage. The injury presumably happened during micropuncture wire insertion into the femoral artery that inadvertently went into the small branch causing injury. Using fluoroscopic guidance when advancing the micropuncture wire can help avoid this complication. This very technique is demonstrated in this short video. So back to our case, the patient went on to have coiling of the inferior epigastric artery, which successfully controlled the bleeding, and she recovered without difficulty. Larger sheaths mean more risk. This is a case of a 75-year-old man with a BMI of 32 who underwent an elective TAVAR procedure. Two per-close sutures had been used to pre-close, but at the end of the case, closure was not successful. Hemostasis could not be achieved. The team went on to place a balloon using a contralateral femoral access over a previously placed safety wire. In the angiogram on the right, we see that despite advancement and deployment of the balloon, hemostasis is still not achieved. Now with a better appreciation of the common femoral artery diameter, the team then placed a larger covered stent and post dilated it managing to achieve hemostasis as demonstrated in this angiogram. What should you do to minimize complications? Plan ahead. Study all available imaging and be aware of the anatomy. Use imaging to guide you in obtaining access. If it is available to you, use both fluoroscopy and ultrasound for better results. Fluoroscopy could help you prevent too high an access, whilst ultrasound can improve your accuracy and prevent too low an access. Use micropuncture kits. Perform routine femoral angiography immediately after obtaining access. Good luck and thanks for watching.